A2IM, the collective voice of independent music. Hi, uh, my name is Sherry Hu, and I am super excited to be giving this keynote presentation. Thank you all so much um, to everyone who's tuning in. So for those who are not familiar with my work, I focus on the intersection of music and tech, and I'm a writer and analyst. Um, I've been writing since 2015, and I've done a mix of freelance writing for the likes of Billboard, Forbes, Music Business Worldwide, NPR Music, um, and many other publications, as well as nowadays working on my own newsletter and Patreon membership um, under the umbrella term Water and Music. And in general, thinking about music and tech, what I'm super interested in more specifically are the higher level system level trends that are driving innovation and um, driving change in the music industry. And I've been very motivated by that mindset um, ever since 2015. And within the past couple of months, just looking at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on how I guess people's priorities have shifted within the music industry, I've noticed a lot of both new and old trends coming up. And, and by that, I mean lots of like really new trends that previously were considered almost like too ambitious or too futuristic that nowadays people actually think are super practical. Thinking from a perspective of like just how to keep the music industry going, how to keep artist labels, et cetera, going. Um, but then there are many other trends that actually are old, like that have been around for decades, but just were not prioritized for whatever reason, um, because artists had other things like streaming and touring and other more traditional models on their minds. And so today talking about quote unquote, emerging technologies and, and business models in the music industry, I, um, I want to approach it from that angle, like looking at both new trends that are truly new and emerging and then ones that we just hadn't really thought about before and why it's more important than ever to think about it now. So looking at the, the trends that have really come up in almost every conversation in the music industry, at least that I've had over the past couple of months, um, as I said, you can divide it into new and old, but then more specifically on the new side, um, you can kind of group all the main trends under this concept of building virtual worlds. And by that, I'm referring to how, um, you know, how audio streaming in the aggregate, if you saw within uh, you know, a couple of weeks between mid-March and early April actually went down, whereas immersive audio, audio visual media consumption went up across film, TV, um, and gaming, and that's been widely reported. And so in that landscape, a lot of artists and labels have been thinking, how, how do we align the music that we're putting out, the audio that we're putting out, with these more immersive experiences and more premium visual experiences? So under that trend, you have um, the rise of avatars and synthetic, like 3D rendered media. Um, and you also have the concept of digital scarcity. So bringing the scarcity of in-person shows, of limited edition physical merch, et cetera, into the digital online world. Um, and you'll see here, I uh, list a lot of specific companies as examples that I'll dive into later as well. On the old side, um, something that I've always professed in my writing is that an artist is really nothing without their community. Um, and that is like certainly not a new concept you know, going all the way back to the concept of, you know, fan clubs uh, and kind of like a pre-internet, pre-streaming age, like those have always been essential. But especially today, as people are stuck at home and artists are looking for ways to, you know, reach out to and engage with their fans directly, they're realizing that the audio streaming model actually like falls really, really short. And again, that, that's a discussion that was being had before, but it's like more pertinent now than ever. And so in terms of like the tech that enables better community building. People are turning increasingly to live streaming. Um, there's a resurgence, even just in the past couple of weeks alone in social audio. So almost like social live, um, almost like phone calls or like podcasting in groups. I'll, I'll dive more into that concept later. And then the rise and the resurgence of direct to fan um, paid membership models, or just any opportunity like through Bandcamp for fans to pay artists directly. Again, not a new model by any means, but has gained um, an increasing amount of importance um, amidst the pandemic over the past couple months. So I'll start with live streaming and social audio. So starting with the kind of old trends that are now emerging back into the forefront of industry conversations. Um, I'm sure all of you watching this have either seen a live stream or tried to host a, host a live stream yourself. So um, I, won't, I won't dive into 
the why of live streaming, because I think you all understand that yourself quite well. But um, in short, as I've written here, I think previously in, in the era of brick and mortar, <clears throat> sorry, uh, brick, brick and mortar touring, live streaming was seen as like a nice to have add on in terms of a way to engage fans, a way to market the in-person show. Um, but now that touring is totally off the table, live and synchronous digital media and like online streaming and these online viewing experiences are, are all artists have. It's not a stepping stone. It's, it's the end as well. Um, and so it's now like a must have, or at least like a must consider for, for every artist and every team in the music industry. And it allows for lots of new and interesting and, and diverse ways to communicate with fans and then also monetize their fandom and their consumption as well. Here are just a couple of stats to illustrate the growth of, um, the growth of live streaming specifically in music. Twitch has seen over 500% growth in music and performing arts viewership on their platform. Um, and it's worth noting here that music as a category, as an entire category is still many times smaller than some of the biggest individual games in the platform. So there's still a cultural gap, but in terms of acceleration, music is one of the fastest growing um, categories in the platform now, and they've dedicated a tab and a very rapidly expanding team to that category as well. In the middle, um, this is from an interview I did on live streaming discovery with bands in town. Um, they found that click-through rates on push notification reminders for live streams that are now listed on their app is close to 80%. Whereas before it might, it might have been only like 10% or like 20% on, on a good day. And th that's in part because people need these reminders for live streams just because there's so many going on. But it also means people are more actively engaged with these apps and actively engaged on their phones and leaning in, which I think is a good sign for artists who are looking to, to keep in touch with them. And then last but not least, Instagram Live, um, as we've seen, especially with these high profile flagship events like Versus Battles, um, usage in general has gone up by over 70% um, just within the span of a month, namely between mid-March and mid-April. And actually just today, this isn't in my presentation, but um, like isn't in the slides, but um, Instagram also just announced ways to monetize um, live streams, so they have a way for fans to like buy digital badges in the stream um, as a way of compensating the creator or the streamer. So that's a really um, important development for music. Here are just a handful of points for uh, to, to keep in mind. I'll just go through them quickly in terms of what live streaming enables and <clears throat> and does not enable, and what kind of platforms and and investors are doing around it. So. One, I think, I think it's such an interesting format because there's a real-time feedback loop of engagement and monetization. And so in, many, in some ways, it's, it's actually more efficient in terms of engaging with fans and leading them to, to contribute than if you were just to release your music on Spotify or pay for ads um, on social media platforms. And while I've noticed like most artists are going live for free, there's a really wide range of monetization opportunities available. You can stream for free, but through platforms like Twitch, you can kind of do the free to play model where you stream for free, but then bands can contribute to you by tipping um, within the stream. Or as I'll talk about later, there are a lot of, um, you know, traditional ticketed or paywall models for live streams as well. Um, and platforms like Instagram, and, uh, like Instagram are uh, increasingly starting to push more live streams within their algorithms. And so that creates like even more incentive for artists to go live more often. And the screenshot you see on the right is um, from this really new social audio startup called Clubhouse. Um, it's, it's kind of like House Party for those of you who are familiar with that app where you can kind of join spontaneous audio only chat rooms in the case of Clubhouse um, with your media social network or just people you follow. And um, it doesn't sound like quite technologically, I guess that interesting or cutting edge, but in recent weeks there have been a ton of um, musicians and, and music industry influencers who have gone in the app. So you see here like MC Hammer and Fat Five Freddy and E40 are talking with a lot of um, influential people in the venture capital world. Um, I was listening in yesterday and Troy Carter was there talking about Spotify and TikTok. And so um, people are, I guess this, this paradigm of social audio is being increasingly normalized as people are looking for like that spontaneous connection online. Whereas previously, I guess it was deprioritized because people took the, the in-person experience for granted. Um, and, and that just drives home that a lot of, uh, just to, to this last point on the left here, while so many artists and event organizers have treated live streaming 
or these live synchronous experiences as a substitute for um, performing in person. It's really not a mode of performance. It's first and foremost a mode of communication. It's a mode of communicating and just engaging with people rather than just putting on a stage to show. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, one section that I'll have for each of the trends that I talk about today are these sets of open questions um, for builders or entrepreneurs or anyone in the music industry, really. And the point that I'm making with this is that no one really knows the future, but I think this is a really interesting time where anyone can build the future and actually have more influence on it than before. Um, and so just some questions for live streaming that are top of mind for me are like, how do we segment the market? Cause it's super crowded right now in terms of the number of platforms out there. Um, and how can we then use that segmentation to better evaluate the various streaming opportunities that might be coming your way? Um, what are more interesting formats aside from just straight performances or archival viewings? I think there's definitely a need for innovation in the content. And then of course, how can we give artists a seat at the table in conversations about the feature? Um, as opposed to just leaving it to Twitch, which is owned by Amazon, Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, YouTube, which is owned by Google. Um, is there a way to kind of steer that, conversation, steer that conversation such that it's not just in the hands of big tech? Still an open question, but one that I think many people watching this um, can like really effectively influence. Next, uh, direct fan uh, and membership models. So th this is one of the like more interesting conversations that I've had in the, in the music industry, because I think, especially in the media outside of music, there's this rhetoric going around that Spotify and similar platforms, quote unquote, save the music industry. Um, I think a lot of artists did not find that to be true. And, and if anything, the, the economic impact of the pandemic on the music industry has like only reinforced that. Like if, if artists are only left with streaming as their digital income with touring completely out of the question, many of them aren't able, like, able to make a living or, or pay their rent. And so in general, on a higher level, there's a conversation around how we lay the foundation for a more sustainable digital economy beyond streaming. And in general, what are the channels out there that have a much more direct and more immediate revenue impact than the like, aggregation driven model like on Spotify or Apple Music, where you might be waiting several months for royalties and you're basically competing with a lot of other artists for the same pool, as opposed to having it really coming directly from the fan. Um, so I'll talk about, yeah, direct fan platforms like Bandcamp and Patreon. So, so here are some more stats just to illustrate the growth and the activity around this model. So uh, as many of you watching this probably know already, Bandcamp um, chose to waive their platform fees for artists on two separate days, um, one in March, uh, late March, and then on May 1st. And within just those 48 hours from, you know, 12 a.m. to 12 a.m. Um, Pacific time, uh, fans paid over $11 million uh, for music and merch directly from artists. Um, and like the site was crashing a, a lot of the time. And it was just a really, it was really hard as, um, at least as, as someone in the music industry, not to see this on social media. It was like a really celebratory moment for music culture. And it's just so interesting that this old model of buying music kind of came back as people realize its value in, in supporting artists directly. Um, in the membership side of things, Patreon has seen over 200% increase in the number of musicians um, joining Patreon and creating pages on their platform. And um, I believe overall, including in music, there's also continued to be an increase in patronage um, to offset whatever like slight increase there was in churn rate because of just the, the general economic situation. So, so people are really leaning in um, and ready to support the artists and creators who they care about. They're not just completely backing down. Um, here, just pictured on the right, are some artists and groups who have um, either make like a significant living on Patreon and or have started their page just in the last couple of months. So um, Doomtree, which is a hip hop collective uh, pictured above, they have over 1,300 patrons on their page and they just started, um, at, they just started their page in late March, I believe. Um, Zola Jesus and Yeji, um, who are uh, both independent artists, they also um, have a thriving community on Patreon as well. On the left, these are just some criteria that I have in mind for how to run a successful membership operation as an artist or a collective or any other kind of music company, um, as it's super different from the traditional recorded music model. 
Um, one, I think unlike how a lot of people think about like playlists on Spotify or the streaming services, membership is not about serving everyone by any means. It's about super serving super fans um, and like really leaning into that base of more loyal fans as opposed to trying to reach everybody just because that's what not what those platforms are built for in terms of discovery. Um, a lot of the artists who are the most successful at membership are also a lot more open and vulnerable um, about themselves and their creative processes and bring fans in behind the scenes, um, which a, a lot of artists had done already like on social platforms, but membership like really structures that as a benefit that fans, you know, directly pay for as opposed to just get ad hoc um, on Instagram through Instagram stories or similar. Um, a lot of, a lot of artists who embrace membership have a more like activist um, bent to them as well, or there's, they're supporting certain values, certain causes that are much more community driven rather than, you know, just the mindset of pay me, I need money. It's like, what, what is the, what is the bigger picture here? And I found that artists who go into membership with that mindset um, are especially successful, especially on, on Patreon. And last but not least, and probably the most important is, um, having the ability and willingness to release music on a consistent basis um, at the rate of even like, you know, once or more, like maybe even every single day um, of the week, such that fans will continually get value out of a membership experience and continually pay. Um, that cadence is quite different from the traditional release schedule. We might only release one or maybe two albums a year. Um, and actually resembles the cadence for podcasters and vloggers in terms of their consistency um, in putting out, you know, content that might not be as long uh, or as like cohesive as like, you know, a longer album. That's something you might be used to, um, but it's important just to keep fans engaged within the system. Some open questions, just as someone who also like runs her own Patreon page and has done a lot of research on membership. It's really hard to find a membership playbook for music. Um, and I think that th this might be because the models are different for, you know, every single artist on a case by case basis. But I think, especially in this time, as there's more activity than ever on Patreon for music, having some kind of, you know, shared hub of knowledge for, you know, how to run successful membership programs, I think, um, could be super useful for the industry right now. Patreon is also an interesting example because their CEO, Jack Conti, who's also an artist, has even like admitted to the media that Patreon's business model is not sustainable because it has low fees and it's raised a lot of venture capital funding. Um, so its fees are like, so, like among the lowest in the membership world, but they're trying to add on all these services like added merch or like a dedicated account manager within the company um, for an added fee in attempt to be able to, you know, make, make, make a profit and sustain themselves given their commitments. Um, so that's a question for future membership platforms. Are there other business models that are both artist friendly and actually sustainable in terms of more realistic expectations of returns? Um, there's one called Ampled um, that I, I believe I listed earlier on a slide. That's um, a platform co-op model where artists actually have ownership um, over the platform when they join. So that's another example um, of one of these alternative um, structures for membership. And then finally, how can membership models benefit collectives and organizations, um, such as labels and venues, and not just individual artists? Um, just like the narrative around DIY artists in, in general, I feel like the conversation around membership tends to be very insular. It's like, how does this individual artist just serve their individual fans, as opposed to how can we come together and in an effort to sustain the industry as a whole, create this kind of group-driven membership experience? Um, and that's something that I would like to see and that I know a lot of other artists would like to see as well. Um, so the next trend, avatars and synthetic media, this is um, transitioning to the section of talking about like truly new and emerging trends. Um, the concept of an avatar, which, which, which I'll dive into deeply um, in, in the next slide, of having this digitally rendered body or some kind of like object, like some kind of object or representation representing the artist in the physical world, as opposed to their actual like human selves, like a camera on their faces. So like if I had an avatar in a game, um, like representing myself in a music video as opposed to my own self. Um, it, this is like, obviously it's like commonplace in some industries like gaming, but now like artists are just creating avatars of themselves out of necessity um, because they can't 
especially for music videos, they can't get together to, you know, produce traditional videos anymore. Um, and they're also trying to, I guess, meet people where they are in terms of them consuming more immersive entertainment and seeking more escapism. And the best way to do that is to build these virtual worlds, build avatars of yourselves that, you know, have a lot more creative freedom and have a lot more to do in these virtual environments as a result that I guess maybe human bodies aren't physically capable of. So here is just, this is just a spectrum of how I understand the landscape. So on one hand, you have celebrities building avatars of themselves. So one of the most talked about examples is the Travis Scott Fortnite show, which is pictured in the bottom left. Um, uh, in, the, in the bottom, uh, sorry, in the middle on the bottom row, you also see an avatar of the RB artist Tanashi. Um, she did a virtual concert with this company called Wave, where she wore a full body motion capture suit and performed as this avatar in this world that took you know, several weeks to build um, for fans on, on YouTube specifically. Um, and then on the top right, you have Jay Balvin. Um, he's partnered with a company called Genies to make an avatar of himself that um, if you go on Spotify on your phone and look at the Canvas videos, it's Jay Balvin's Genie that appears in all the um, videos Canvas videos for his latest album, Coloris, rather than just himself. Um, and then in the other direction, you have avatars from scratch who are like fictional characters. So essentially like IP, the same way that, you know, Marvel has its own, you know, I guess IP slate of characters um, becoming musical celebrities in their own right. Here, pictured here are um, Lil Michaela, who's developed by a company called Bread, based in Los Angeles. And she's been um, on billboards in Times Square um, from Spotify for the singles that she's released. And she has over 2 million followers on Instagram, completely 100% uh, computer rendered. Um, in the middle, in the top row, you have a company called Strange Loop, um, which uh, just came out of the Techstars Music cohort for this year. And they're working on what they call a virtual label, kind of as a similar model to Bread with the music focus. And then um, finally, in the bottom right, you have um, you have avatars like Kizuna AI, um, who's an example of what people call a VTuber, which is super popular in Japan. There are several thousand of these VTubers or like animated YouTubers or influencers that are building followings on YouTube right now. As, as I alluded to earlier, um, for to kind of, I guess, bring these artist avatars to their fullest realizations to create these immersive experiences that fans are really interested in as they're navigating more towards gaming, um, film, TV, et cetera, you need virtual worlds. Um, and so you're seeing um, a myriad of companies, both inside and outside of music, and especially in the gaming world, um, partner directly with artists because they have the, already have the expertise in-house on building these immersive interactive worlds for artists. And so I mentioned the Fortnite show with Travis Scott, which is pictured above. Um, I mentioned Wave, which has worked with um, several dozen artists at this point on kind of taking their own virtual shows. Um, and then Minecraft, the kind of open world game, is becoming an increasingly popular game for staging virtual shows. And unlike Fortnite or unlike Wave, um, the Minecraft model is, I think, a lot more DIY in that anyone can basically set up their venue um, and build a venue if they, if they have the skills and the expertise to do that. Um, so I think that's why you're seeing a lot more event organizers go to Minecraft as opposed to these bigger properties um, like Fortnite. As for the future, and I think for the concerns with this trend, um, there are a couple of questions that come to mind for me. So one is how to make the avatar economy accessible to more artists, not just to those with the access to an exclusive Fortnite deal. Um, I think just, yeah, thinking about including all artists, whether independent or major, in this space, that's a really um, legitimate concern, especially because at the scale of something like a Fortnite show, the cost to do that in terms of like the development um, and, and the production is like almost akin to like a Coachella set um, from to, to, to my knowledge. And so it's, it's not necessarily cheaper, even if the scale is a lot bigger. Um, other question is, uh, yeah, it was definitely related in terms of like getting the right skills and the right collaborators to build these virtual worlds. Um, CGI artists and other kind of 3D game developers um, are really expensive in terms of um, in terms of like their average salary. And so like, is there a way for 
whether it's like artists, managers, or I know like a lot of labels already thinking about this, um, is there a way to affordably bring them in house to help them build virtual worlds for their artists on a regular basis? How does that change the meaning of being artists in general? You know, I think the concept of these immersive virtual worlds expands far, far beyond just the album that is that you put out like once every year or so. And then finally, how can these avatars complement rather than simply replace artists' existing activities and social presence? So rather than being totally sub substitutional, how can it augment the art that's already happening from, from human artists? And last but not least, uh, this is also an emerging trend that hasn't quite yet been proven, but I think could be super valuable, especially in this time. Touring, I think, as a, as a revenue stream is so important for artists. An artist will only be able to perform, you know, one show in one city uh, once a year to a limited audience. And so because of that, they can, you know, very often charge a premium um, for access to those shows. So that's totally off the table. And then as a result of that exchange, artists have been forced to shift to a model of ubiquity um, because there isn't that much a cult of, of a culture of art of, um, I guess, of fans paying for these exclusive like live experiences online. The fact that like, you know, they're mostly free means that Artist, there's just so much noise online and artists like feel even like more pressure to post even more and go live even more often online, mostly for free, um, especially given that Facebook and Instagram remain like two of the most popular platforms to go live. And for the most part, they're still not that monetizable. So the, like the, all that to say, the question is, is there a possibility where we don't take music's ubiquity online as given? And we start to think about these more digitally scarce premium goods and experiences that can maybe stand in for shows in the meantime, or also um, augment the, the fan experience before or after an in-person show. So in my mind, there are three main types of scarcity in music. There are events, as I was talking about with touring, um, there are connections, which fans will pay for in person through these VIP fan meet and greets. And then there are objects, like if you only manufacture limited edition merch or vinyl. Like in the fashion world, brands like Supreme have, um, you know, mastered the scarcity model to, to a T. And so we can go through each of these and, and find a lot of emerging platforms that are trying to take each of these forms of scarcity online. So first off now, there's such a crowded landscape of platforms that allow artists to charge admission to live streams or any creator, any event host. Um, and so most of these are just like a traditional ticketed model um, with some instances like Run the World, which focuses on conferences. There are a lot of, lots of opportunities for horizontal interaction and networking among attendees instead of just, you know, a we like a webinar style, just a host talking straight to the audience. That said, in my mind, there's actually very little differentiation right now among these platforms, especially the newer ones coming up in terms of what they really bring to the table. Um, aside from exclusive talent partnerships that they launch with, or maybe some kind of data analysis capabilities on the back end. So that's just something to follow in the coming months. Like, will there be some consolidation? Um, what other features might come up? As of right now, it's, it's actually quite, quite homogenized in terms of the wider landscape. As for connections, there's also an emerging landscape of um, platforms that are doing these online fan meet and greets. Um, so either like online live fan meet and greets in the sense of like video, like FaceTime style video chats that artists can do with fans and that fans can like screenshot and share after the fact or um, on demand video messages from celebrities, which platforms like Cameo um, have popularized. And with, and in this landscape, actually compared to live streaming, there's a bit more diversity in terms of the experience that um, experiences that artists can give to fans and as well as like the pricing models that artists can build around them. Last but not least, um, you have digitally scarce objects. This is probably the most emerging um, concept in terms of people's even just like awareness of it, let alone um, willingness to adopt it. But you have companies like um, Our Song, which is pictured here in the phone screenshots and, and Fan Apply. They're both trying to build digital trading cards and kind of digital tradable collectibles um, around artists or musical events. So it's not pictured here, but Fanapply um, released a limited number of trading cards related to Travis Scott's Fortnite show for fans to kind of commemorate the fact that they were there. Um, this actually 
is not a totally new trend in that around 2015, 2016, a lot of companies tried to do this with blockchain. But needless to say, uh, that tech has not really developed that much since then. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, there isn't a use case and a demand for that kind of experience right now. There's also, uh, there are companies like Landmark, pictured here, that are um, allow artists to geofence new music or digital merch drops. So that could be super interesting if you're looking to maintain a sense of like a local experience like you would with a show, um, but virtually in many more cities around the world. And then last but not least, you have virtual merch, which is already quite common in the gaming world where you can, you know, fans spend billions of dollars every year buying weapons and skins for their characters in certain games. Um, but there are a couple of companies like on the left here, um, if you see this woman wearing a dress, that dress is 100% digital. Um, it was auctioned off use, using blockchain um, for around $9,000, I believe, by, and it was produced by a company called The Fabricant. That's, that co they call themselves the digital fashion house. Um, and, they're, and they're manufacturing these, I guess, yeah, they're, they're trying to take the luxury haute couture, I guess, culture offline and bring that online um, with really advanced kind of CGI driven fashion. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration with the music industry, especially once there's um, kind of more cross-pollination with the gaming world as well, given that fans are already used to this concept um, in that world. As for the open questions um, for this space, I think uh, obviously, you know, if a lot of people are um, out of a job um, and they're stuck at home and they don't have that much money to spend, there's the importance of balancing scarcity with accessibility on online. Um, it's kind of a chicken or egg issue um, in terms of, you know, whether artists should be the first to step forward and introduce this concept to fans, um, whether platforms should should do that, um, or or whether fans will do that. It's kind of, it's, it's an open question in terms of who will be the first to step in and push this model forward. There's a question of how do we build digital goods that fans actually want to pay for, and I think we can look at sectors like gaming and fashion for inspiration. And then finally, this might be the place for technologies like blockchain and cryptocurrency to actually have their moment because what that technology enables in terms of being able to verify ownership, um, reduce fraud, you know, uh, I guess eliminate the ability to make copies of, of certain digital goods, which is obviously a concern in the music industry historically. Um, it could be a really cool opportunity for that to come back um, in, in this current time. Uh, that is it for the trends that are top of mind for me and that I hope all of you watching this will have, you know, walk away um, with some new ideas about and hopefully will be inspired to build. And here is some contact info for me. If you want to reach me, um, feel free to email me here or um, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And of course, follow my newsletter.